We'll have now pa Paul Kalbfleisch from the US, and Paul is an innovative marketing expert, or executive, sorry, executive, with a really breadth of experience and working for global leaders in technology, financial services, and creative agencies. For 10 years, Paul has managed and grew the BlackBerry brand, so we move on to the next big brand in the cell phone and uh, mobile devices market, and he recently was the vice president of brand creativity. He established a core communication framework at uh, BlackBerry and he transferred it in the prosumer space, a combination of producer and consumer, the prosumer uh, space, and you introduced several sub-brands, among them Bold, Pearl and Curve. And this is not all because you have also done social media programming, uh, sponsorship programs with you 2 the Black Eyed Peas, just to name Two. And so um, we are looking forward to your uh, presentation on the epic music as brand anthems. Please welcome Paul. Paul. Thank you very much. Um, it's always great to be between you and lunch. It's the perfect spot to be. <laughs> I either get that slot or the end of the day where I'm between you and a drink. So I'll take, I'll take, uh, I'll take this one right now. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I spent 10 years developing and growing the framework of the BlackBerry brand. Um, I left Research in Motion and BlackBerry back in February of this past year. So all your questions about hey, what just happened with those guys? You'll have to address somebody else. That's, 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 that's not my thing. Um, also, very quickly, I have two blogs up right now, one being uh, called Short Gaze at Blogspot. Um, that one has to do with my points of view on marketing and culture and the intersection of those points, which will be part of what we talk here today. The other one called Art Under Us, which oddly enough is a photo blog about the art of manhole covers, and if you want to take a look at that, that's uh, a lot of fun as well. Um, you've been here listening to music, sounds, uh, melodies as uh, ways of expressing brands, the roles they have in branding. Um, the opportunity and the thing that I want to talk about today is when you can go all the way and use uh, songs as representations of what a brand stands for uh, and almost taking them to the point of, of, of anthems for a brand. doesn't happen very often. Uh, I had one interesting experience with it that I want to convey to you today and, and we can talk about that. Um, really what branding is, don't want to get into a lot of detail, we have a short period of time so I kept it very simple. It's the idea of taking the functionality and the emotion associated with a product and putting that together and that's when you're talking about branding. Really it, it is, used to be, in my mind, the storytelling. If you're a brander, if you're a marketer, you are a storyteller. And so you have to tell the story about the functionality, the story about the emotions, and putting it together to create branding. I'd argue now, in today's world, you have to step that up from storytelling to being the manager of a dialogue. Because it is not just you speaking to the world, the world wants to talk back to you. The world wants to participate in your, brand, in your branding. So you are a manager of a framework for dialogue, um, the rhetoric that goes back and forth. Functionality is fairly easy to manage, you know, what does the brand do, it does this, it does that, you press this button, press that button. The other part of it, the emotion, is, is, is a whole different story. There are many emotions involved in branding. How does the product how does it feel to use the product? And I don't just mean tactile, but emotionally, how does it feel? I also mean, how does the product make me feel about myself? 
And then ultimately, how, does the, how do I want others to feel about me when I use the product? I used to do a presentation on branding uh, and the difference between a product and a brand, and I used to pull out a, uh, a Mont Blanc pen and uh, sort of you know, took the pen apart, held the cartridge and said, this is the actual product. All the plastic and chrome is the brand. The product cost $7, the brand cost 250 It made me feel a certain way about myself because I had a Mont Blanc pen and because it had that little white star that was about me trying to tell the rest of the world something about me and how they wanted to feel about me. And I used to, always used to say, when you put the pen on the table, you had to point it outward so the star was out. Because if the star was pointing in, the pen was broken because it wasn't telling a certain thing. Point being here is emotions are very complex and they're very, very messy. And a lot of companies like to put pen, emotions in quadrants and say it sits here and it sits there and make life nice and easy. Life isn't nice and easy. But... Music is one of the few tools as a storyteller, as a manager of a dialogue. It's, to me, it's one of the most richest tools one can use to manage and leverage this world of emotions and the complexities of it. Probably more so than anything else in my mind. Um, in the past, we as marketers primarily relied on visuals visual cues to stimulate and manage emotion and to tell an emotional story. You know, there were logos, you know, Coke used the Santa Claus characters, and there, you know, Michelin has a character. Uh, jingles, jingles started to come into play, you know, and, and, and now we are moved into the world, you know, when, when Intel went ba 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 bum and then, oh, now we've got another little tool. Uh, and then some of the things you've been hearing today. But those things are all about the brand talking to the people, saying, remember me. This is kind of my, what I stand for, remember me, remember me. But in today's world, consumers are kind of looking for, yeah, but what about the emotion of me? And I learned this in the days of, uh, the early days of BlackBerry, um, when we really had no idea what we were really getting a hold of, how big of a tiger we were grabbing by the tail. And what happened early on in those days of the early days of s smartphones was people were putting those phones on tables like cowboys coming into the saloon and putting their guns on the table and who had the better gun, you know? And well, we had a Blackberry, well, you know, that's, I'm better than you, or you had you know, um, an iPhone, and, and, and you get into that world. And it became about, even in our world of technology, it became as much of a brand and a label for me as you know, whether I had you know, a, a Ben Sherman label showing or, or whatever. That was a very powerful moment for us. It's getting now more powerful and more strange out there because now it's really moving quickly towards the emotion of us. And what do I mean by that is that the younger generation coming forward expects brands to participate in their world, expects to participate with the brands, expects the brands to have a point of view in society and to demonstrate that. I don't... The, I don't want you to just sell me something. I want you to show me how you behave in the world I live in, that kind of activity. And they want to align with brands. And then on top of that, you know, the world has gotten to the point where rock stars are brands and brands are rock stars, and it's very much a very complex and messy thing again. But... It's even hit an, a higher height, and it's happening in certain ways today. You have Occupy Wall Street, and they are tearing down Occupy Wall Street today and trying to evict those people. That is a whole generation of kids who don't have the advantages 
that many of us have. Those doors are closed, we've consumed it. Sorry, you have to find your own way. And so they are finding their own way, but within their way, within their world, they're saying, it's not a, it's, things are not in silos. Things are complex, they understand that. They get that the jobs they have, the jobs they will get, are somehow connected to sustainability. And they're looking for brands to talk to me about stability, sustainability, talk to me about all of these things all at once. And it's the emotion of us. How can brands make a statement? How can brands make people believe they actually play a role in all of this? If you have a real story, uh, one of the most powerful ways you can do that is through an anthem of music. Now, the irony of all this is that this, the, this has happened before, and I'll demonstrate this by hopefully clicking on this and making this work. Many, 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 many years ago, it worked very, very well. If I can pull this up. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. that's old is new again because that was from the era of the late 60s of turmoil and youth saying, hey, we don't have a future. That moment was captured by Coke. I don't know if anybody here works for Coke. Um, people I know who work at Coke are still trying to figure out how to get back there You're after, you know, after 30 years. Um, do I have command Q to get out of there? And we're back. Hey, it worked. Um, beautiful moment, song became a single by this, another group that came along and just recorded it, I believe, uh, or it was the other way around, I don't know, but it, it was, it captured a moment and it was believable, it really worked for Coke, it became something that was meaningful for everybody and Coke has been writing it for, for years. So. Let's move forward to me for a moment. A number of years ago, while I was working at BlackBerry, um, got a knock on our door and it was U2. And U2 said, would you please be interested in sponsoring our tour and helping us launch our new album, uh, No Line on Horizon? Um, it's hard to say no when new U2 knocks on your door. Um, so we said yes, even though we weren't quite sure what we were going to do with it. Um, you two, even as big as they are, have the same problem that many bands have and artists have, which is they can't get air radio airplay. So they are trying to make deals where, okay, we'll work with brands and we'll give brands some of our music. Uh, the brands can use the music and that's how we will get airplay and get people recognizing that we have, have new, uh, new material. Um, we sponsored their tour. We kind of agreed that we would um, get some of their music from the new album. We would use it in some spots. Nice thing about it is we got the music for nothing because we were promoting it. Uh, we just agreed to a certain amount of media buy and that's how the relationship was. No money actually really changed hands. Um, and from a financial transaction perspective, the lines were clear and it was fairly successful for us. But from a marketing and a branding perspective, things were less clear. What we knew was we had a big band and we had a big brand 
and perhaps there was a chance for a big idea. Beyond that, the rules were very, very wobbly. From our perspective and my CEO's perspective, he really wanted to take advantage of this. He wanted to make a bold statement in some way, shape, or form, uh, not just about products, although our products were clearly involved. U2 is a band of big ideas. And Bono and The Edge, who were the primary creative drivers, were very interested in doing the same. And we would sit down and we'd all have these wonderful holding hands discussions where, yes, we want to do something big. We want to create an anthem of some sort. We want to make a spot that really makes the world feel good about themselves and says something about the relationship between you two and BlackBerry. Challenge was we didn't know what that relationship was. We hadn't defined that. It was kind of like, we're here, you're here, and so what are we gonna do? Um, the interesting thing is, is that the story I'll tell is there's no reason why it should have succeeded. In fact, it should have failed because we weren't clear about what we were trying to say. We had an essence of it, but it really shouldn't have worked but it ended up actually working in, in its own way. What we were clear about was, I was clear about what the BlackBerry brand at that time stood for. The BlackBerry brand had its heritage in business and enterprise, probably many of you at one point carried Blackberries, and in the prosumer consumer space, the early stages of that. Um, what it stood for, what it was, it was the brand that allowed you to get things done. And if you carried a BlackBerry, you were a person who got things done. Um, I always wanted the slogan under our logo to be, and pardon my language, but I always wanted it to be BlackBerry, get shit done. Our lawyers never really kind of agreed to that. But I was, you know, I, I tried. Um, and U2 was a band that also was large and pushed forward. So we had that together and we knew that within all of that space there could be a message. The message our CEO wanted was we were just all going into the first round of this awful recession and everyone was feeling awful about everything. He wanted to say, no, there is a future and you can participate in creating the future and BlackBerry is part of it. We're a brand of doing things. You two is a band, a band of hope. That was about all the tools we had. Now, the thing about, I'm, re I'm reading a wonderful book right now called Truth in Design. And one of the things that they speak about in that book is that all design harnesses energy and uses it in a certain way. If you are an architect and you design a house, you are capturing light and pushing light through the house to light up all areas. If you are doing art, you are harnessing a message and pushing it into a certain context so it provides a certain meaning. When we were trying to create an anthem, we, didn't, we, we were very wobbly and not knowing quite what the message was going to be. But we kept working at it. I, here are the things that we had going against us, and I'll try and keep this rolling. One of the things we had going against us was that we were trying to push products. The other th th which was kind of a challenge for U2. Even though U2 was getting in bed with marketers, they wanted to keep their distance from products. U2 was also, as much as Bono and The Edge like to think of themselves as cutting edge, they were now the establishment. The music world had been moved, has moved forward those are the establishment people, and they behaved in an establishment way. They wanted to protect what they had. They didn't want to get too risky on things. So there were lots of meetings where I was throwing out ideas, and U2 was going, well, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure, and I'm not sure. The other thing that was the challenge was we were, we were supposed to get their single and use their single as the song that we would wrap around. That single was called Magnificent. And it felt natural as a way of getting to the point of, of, of an anthem. 
Partway through the creative process, they released that single early and came and said, actually, we've changed our mind. We're going to give you this song because it's the next one to come out and we need you to promote that. And it was called Crazy Tonight. And there was, there was no thought at all by anybody about back to what our goal was. It was now a business transaction. So we've got people, we've got conflicting ideas, we've got taking the content and throwing that out and throwing new content in, and somehow we're still going to try and create an anthem. I remember sitting on an airplane going, okay, wait a minute, what am I going to do with this song? And I actually said, well, you know, I don't even, I have no clue what the first verse even means. So throw out the first verse. I like the second verse. Let's take the second verse, make it the third, first verse. Let's take the, the third chorus and put it there and take the guitar solo from the middle and put it at the end and that can be just where the logos appear and kind of winds out. And so I actually had a team recut it and then I had the joy of presenting to Bono and The Edge, hey, I rearranged your song and I think it's pretty good. And uh, I, I remember Bono's term was, it's, it, it's in his Irish voice, it's, it's a noble try. <laughs> you, you've, you've done a noble try. And, um, but actually it is how we did it. Um, but through it came a bit of a message lyrically. And the lyric started to become this. Every generation gets its chance to change the world. Pity the nation that doesn't listen to its boys and girls because the sweetest melody is the one we haven't heard. It's not a hill, it's a mountain as we start to climb. Listen to me, I'll be shouting, shouting at the darkness, squeezing sparks of light. Because if we don't go crazy, we're going to go crazy tonight. The in all of that was an essence of another generation coming and paying attention to that next generation. And the idea that, yeah, it's hard work, but you gotta get, you know, we're here to get stuff done. And at the same time, a bit of celebration and a bit of joy. We felt we had something, we couldn't figure out how we were ever gonna end it. Um, I wanted to end it with Blackberry loves big ideas. And that was my line. And I fought hard for it. But I was up against the best salesman in the world, who was Bono. And he convinced us to, to convince the company and, and, and my former CEO that the line should be, Blackberry loves you too. <laughs> And I can actually say, you know, you, you have, you know, sometimes in your life you have good stories. And my best story was, I'm actually standing in Bono's living room in Dublin, going, "You, you got wh what? <laughs> it's like you got you seriously? At some point, will you two say they love BlackBerry?" <laughs> Which kind of didn't happen, right? So for all of those reasons, it shouldn't have worked because it was chaos. At one point, Bono was asking, can we make a 45 second commercial? Because I'd like the longer, I'd like a longer thing. And I'm going, they don't make, no, you can't have 45 seconds. You sure, you sure we can't get a 45 second commercial? No, it's 60, 30s or 15s, they don't make 45 second commercials. Uh, or perhaps he wanted 43, I'm not sure. Um, but out of it, what we had were those little elements of honesty amongst ourselves. There was honesty in the melody of the song. And we were able to sort of play around and get some honesty in, 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 in the lyrics. And then the spot became this. Appearing. Okay. Generation gets a chance to change the world. Pick the nation that will listen to you, boys and girls. Cause the sweetest melody is the one we is the
Yeah, the library loves it too. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but none of that mattered because emotionally people got it. Most of the people captured a couple words. They captured the emotion coming out of it. And even at the end, Blackberry Loves You Too started to, in people's minds, as we did research to find out, it was that it wasn't that Blackberry loved the band, it was like Blackberry loved what U2 was saying. That's how, they, that's how they pulled out of it. And it was a very interesting experience. Did this change the world the way the Coke spot did, or, or revolutionized marketing? No. Could it have been done better? Absolutely. The reason I show it is not, frankly, that I'm all that proud of it. But what I'm showing is that this is an untapped creative space that brands can create anthem spots to capture and communicate and convey their role in society, what society uh, is looking for from them. Um, because brands no longer have the ability to be sort of little siloed things that just sell stuff. You have to participate in society because that generation that we don't understand because they don't have one single point of view and why don't they have one single point of view? Um, they're not about having one single point of view. They've grown up in the, with the internet, they've grown up with social media, they understand better than we do the complexities of the way life weaves together. And we have to start finding emotional tools and emotional storytelling abilities that can communicate to them, and I think Brand Anthems is a possible place for us to go. Thank you.